Well, good morning. And firstly, can I say thank you so much for having me down here. And I don't very often get into London because I'm so busy where I am, uh, uh, to be honest, on a daily basis. But it's always an honor to come down to London. When I saw St. Catherine's Dock for the first time in my life, I was like, wow. We literally walked around the corners, saw that beauty out there, and it just makes for a, a beautiful day. And you know what, sometimes we need that. Sometimes we need to have that beauty in our lives because we get so sucked up in our businesses and I get sucked up into my own business. I, you know, I literally have not had a day off for about three weeks. So what I have to do is force myself to have one day where I switch the phone off uh, and spend time with the family just so I can relax. However, before that, um, I've had Th nearly three decades of doing exactly that and I've learned now to slow down. You see for 32 years I was in the UK police service, I was a police officer and for 20, nearly, uh, 22 years of that I was a senior police officer in the UK police service. In all of that time I have been making decisions, I've been woken up at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, I was what we call a, a gold commander, so the most serious operational decisions that needed to be made I was a person making those. Anything from firearms to pro, um, public disorder to policing football, football matches, all those situations in life where life and death decisions need to be made or very serious decisions need to be made that affect life and death, I was making those. And sometimes I was making those decisions at 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock in the morning. After having run my own department at work full of three or 400 people. So I understand leadership. Since I left the police service four and a half years ago, my single one passion is leadership. And I'm hoping that I can share with you some strategies. I now work with business leaders and organizational leaders at the highest levels to understand this concept of loneliness. And two ladies have mentioned loneliness. I'm so pleased that they did. I actually said thank you to them for mentioning the fact that we can be very lonely as leaders. You see, the truth of it is that we get so sucked up into our business, into our world, into the lives that we live. We get so sucked up into the passion of creating whatever it is that we want to create, the portfolios, the business, the legacy that you want to leave for your families, that you very often neglect yourself. And when you suddenly wake up and you realize, hang on a minute, I haven't got a life at all because my life is 100% over here. And there is nobody else making the decisions that need to be made but me. And if I get those decisions wrong, who do I turn to? That is the lives that we are all leading. And it's about the level of honesty that we have with ourselves in admitting that to ourselves, which is the first step. But I'm going to assume that you've made those steps. I'm going to assume that you've already admitted that to yourself. You've admitted that business is not easy. And it doesn't matter to me whether that's property or whether that's a pharmaceutical industry. Whatever your business is, we all have that same journey. So I'm assuming that you're enlightened enough individuals to have had that conversation with yourself. Because what I want to do is not talk about the pain, I want to talk about some solutions, because I'm a solution-focused individual. But firstly, I want to talk about leadership. What is leadership? You see, when we talk about leadership, it's very easy for us to start thinking about individuals like this. People sitting in meetings, or maybe people making big decisions in the European Parliament or somewhere of a similar ilk, political leaders. Or we think about people you know, running teams, or people who are inspiring the world and changing the world through the way they've touched the world. Or perhaps we see leaders like this. Or we perhaps see leaders like this. Maybe we see leaders like this. Now, I don't know what your political opinion is. I don't really have political opinions, but what I always have is uh, opinions on leadership. And I think you'll all agree with me, irrespective of whichever political party you support, the, the leadership that's been demonstrated in this, in this country at the highest level of politics is the worst I've ever seen. Because nobody seems to have any clarity, nobody seems to have any vision. And you as business owners will have a sense of vision. You know where you want to take your business, right? But we don't seem to have any sense of where we want to take the country. And then there's so much infighting that's going on. There's no cross-party understanding of something that's going to affect the whole country. Everybody is looking after themselves. And that's the worst kind of leadership that you can have. But even these people will have had their lonely times. You saw Theresa May doing her, her, her goodbye speech or her announcement that she was stepping down. And you saw how emotional that she was. 
Do you think that she might have had those dark moments by herself in her house crying away? Of course she will have. And that comes as part and parcel of leadership. I've had those dark moments myself. I've had those moments where at 3 o'clock in the morning, I have literally worked a 12-hour shift and I'm in bed and I'm asleep and I get a phone call and say, boss, we've got a man running loose with a, with a gun in a built-up area at 3 o'clock in the morning. What do we do? So I'm now making decisions, right, let's get the firearms officers there. That's a big decision to make, but these are the decisions that we make. And you will be making decisions of a similar gravitas yourself every single day. Do I buy this property or not? Do I spend this kind of money or not? Do I tell one of my team to do this or not? Do I take this risk or not? You're taking these decisions every single day of your lives. Now some of you have been in this game for so long that you're taking these decisions without even thinking about it. Because you're good at it. But what we're not realizing is every single decision that we make is having an other added impact on who we are and our mental well-being. And a lady over there talked about her mental well-being and how being in property or being a business person took her to the edge of her mental health. And we're all sort of going there. So how do we get out of it? How do we prevent that? So just on this whole issue of leadership, you know if you were to if you were to Google the word leadership, you'd get something like 1.5 billion results from Google. 1.5 billion results, which tends to suggest to me that everybody is interested in leadership. And yet when you look at the uh, Oxford English Dictionary definition of what leadership is, you get this. The action of leading a group of people or an organization. Now I don't know about you, but if the Oxford English Dictionary has to use the word leading to describe the word leadership, it sort of suggests to me that they, they don't fully understand it. So I am a non-conformist. I've come up with my own definition. And this is what I believe leadership is all about. It simply is about influencing people or influencing circumstances. Now when you start looking at that definition, you start seeing leadership in a wholly different way. Just by a show of hands, please, raise your hands if you're a parent. And keep your hands raised, um, because I want to pick up on those people who haven't raised their hands. Raise your hands if you've got a sibling, a brother or a sister. Raise your hands if you've got children. Raise your hands if you've got friends. So now every single person, thank you so much, every single person in this room will have raised their hands at some point in time. And here's the thing, guys. If people are coming to you for advice at some point in your life because they think that you know better than them, or if they've got a problem and they think you're the person they need to speak to, you're a leader because you're influencing people and you're influencing circumstances. So don't you think, would you not agree that if you're going to be a leader anyway, you may as well be the very best version of a leader that you can be within your capacity? Yes or no? Yes? yes? So that's what we need to strive for. But you cannot pour from an empty cup. We cannot be good leaders unless we are good leaders to ourselves. The journey of leadership always starts from within ourselves. We have to start learning to lead ourselves. We have to start learning to look after ourselves. My, I manage my health very, very well. I've just turned 53. I'm so passionate about the work that I do that I want to continue to do this work for the next 20 to 30 years. Somebody asked me the other day, you left the police service, you retired from the police service, the very next day you started this business, so when do you retire from this? And I, I don't like the word retire, because the word retire means you retire yourself out. I don't want to do that. I want to be full of energy and exuberance wherever I go. I want to leave a legacy wherever I go. I want to impact on the world, but I want to do it on my, on my own grounds. So, We've got to look after ourselves, it's so very important. And the mark of an outstanding leader is not just how good a leader you are. It's not just about how good you are in what you do, but it's about how many leaders you develop. You see, life is a bit of a conveyor belt. People come on one end of the conveyor belt and they'll move through life and eventually at the other end of the conveyor belt they will drop off. There's a great poem called The Indispensable Man, if you've never read that. That, if your ego is in the way and telling you 
that your world cannot operate without you, trust me, it can. There are always other people coming onto this conveyor belt, and it's important that we invest in those other people. If you have teams right now, this is why developing your teams, developing your staff is so critically important. So what I don't want is for any of you to be this person in the room, looking out soulfully into the street, wondering what's going on, wondering how you can change your life, wondering how you can manage the decisions that you're managing, wondering how you can, you can be comfortable within yourself, within your skin, uh, with the decisions that you have to take on a day-to-day -day basis. Inner leadership comes first. So what I want to talk to you about is today, emotional intelligence. Anyone ever heard of emotional intelligence? So emotional intelligence has been around as a, as a neuroscientific concept since 1995, there or thereabouts. And it's a phrase that a lot of people use, but very, very few people understand. So I would love to spend two days here going through emotional intelligence with you because I know you would get a lot of benefit from it, but what I'm going to be, I'm not going to be able to do that. So what I'm going to do is go into one of the quadrants of emotional intelligence, really go into that in some depth uh, to a point where you can actually take some strategies away and hopefully you can start implementing some of these strategies uh, for yourselves. Is that okay? Okay. So emotional intelligence, let's have an understanding of what emotional intelligence is. There's four quadrants of emotional intelligence. The number one quadrant is, and it's the same in life, it's self-awareness. Unless we are aware of who we are and unless we are aware of the emotions that we feel and how those emotions then impact on the actions that we take, we can't grow anywhere else. So that's the first quadrant. The second quadrant of emotional intelligence is self-management. So now that we know ourselves at a deeper level, now that we understand our emotions, what do we need to do to manage that to be better. I'll give you an example of that. 16 years ago, I think it's just over 16 years ago, um, I went on a trip to India and I had this like an, an awareness. You know, you could call it spiritual awareness, but I didn't go to anywhere spiritual. I just had this awareness. I just had this, you know how you've been somewhere and something just clicks inside you and just wake up and you realize something? And I realized I was leading a very, very unhealthy life. At that time, I was a detective chief inspector. I was in charge of uh, serious crime. I was investigating homicides. It's the kind of stuff that you see on, on TV. But the life I was living that, leave, living that was associated with that stuff was not good. Now, there's, if there's one thing I can tell you about senior detectives, we like to have a drink. Uh, so every night, all the senior detectives, and there's only like four or five of us, we would get together every single night we would have a drink and we would talk about the, the cases that we were going on with uh, what we'd got going on I might have a murder being invested that I'm investigating somebody else might be investigating a kidnapping etc etc and we would help each other out just by talking but as we're helping each other what we're not realizing is the pints are going down and I was drinking literally about four or five pints a night and then I prided myself that I was also a whiskey connoisseur now, I don't know about you, I don't know if you know much about the Asian society, particularly the Indian society much, I'm a Punjabi, so we're from the northwest of uh, India. And if there's one thing that the Punjabis uh, pride themselves on, is that they can drink whiskey. They can drink whiskey and they can eat. And I was just like that, but I was like into the high level whiskey. So it's expensive whiskey, so you know, I didn't feel so bad about it. But I just had this awareness, I just suddenly woke up I was a guy that if you took me to a steakhouse, I'd have to have the biggest steak on the menu just to test myself. Can I do this? Can I eat this steak? I was on 25 cigarettes a day. I'd been smoking since the age of 16 when I joined the police service. To fit in, I started smoking and then I could never stop smoking. Uh, what I used to do was every time I stopped smoking, I'd say to myself, wow, you've managed six weeks, so I'm going to reward myself with a cigarette. One's not going to hurt, so you'd have one cigarette and it always happened in a pub when I'm out with my mates and I'd be walking to the toilet and suddenly I see those, can you remember those old-fashioned cigarette machines? I'd say, oh, do you know what, one's not going to hurt, so I'd put some money in. So then you get a packet of cigarettes, you smoke one, and you're just about to throw it away and say, well, that's a waste of money. So I'll keep it for the next six weeks. Six weeks later, I'll have another one within a week. 
So that was a cycle I was stuck in. But I had this awareness that if I truly wanted to live a life that I was proud of, a life that was really going to fill me with energy, where I was really going to have an impact on life and people around me, I needed to look after myself. I understood that it all starts with myself. I needed to manage myself. On that day, I gave up smoking, drinking, eating meat and fish and eggs. I just threw those in overnight. And I haven't touched them since. I don't even think about them. Because when you get your mindset in a certain place, then you can have that level of control that you don't even, you're not even thinking about this stuff. You're never tempted by it. So about six years ago, I, te I tested this on myself. I thought, could this really happen again? Could I do it again? So I, do, I was doing some research on coffees and teas and things like that. And I realized I didn't think coffee and tea was very good for me. So overnight, I stopped drinking coffee, tea. I only drink green tea now and water. Uh, I, and at the same time, I thought, why not throw in all fizzy drinks? And I threw in juices unless they're freshly squeezed. So I haven't touched that for six years. And that was overnight. Three years ago, I'm, I'm really now intrigued by this. How is this happening? So three years ago, nearly four years ago, I stopped drinking milk overnight. I only drink almond milk. And I have never, ever thought about drinking milk again. How is it just like that I was able to do it? I wrote a book called Smash the Habit. Teaching people that smashing habits is not about getting into some kind of a fad diet or getting into some kind of hypnotic state. It is literally about having power over your mind. It's literally about emotional intelligence. When you have a deep sense of self-awareness and you understand what you like about yourself and what you don't like about yourself, what's empowering and what's disempowering, when you resonate that at the deepest possible level, then you can start managing that much more effectively and you can make these powerful decisions, that is it, no more, never going to happen again in my life. And that's essentially what I did. Now there's th two other quadrants of emotional intelligence which are equally important. And for you guys they are very important because as business people, and you are here now in a networking event, I think Ranjit said something about networking, is about building relationships. I got asked uh, a couple of weeks ago, why don't you ever make, uh, why don't you sell from the stage? Why don't you get people to run to the back of the room and make, I just don't do it. It's not in my value system. I just don't believe. I believe to give, on giving value from the stage and the relationships I nurture after that always result in sales. Always result in sales. You guys are here right now. And the two quadrants that we're going to talk about now will really apply in the here and now. One is social awareness. Social awareness is about understanding how your organization, your community, or this environment that you're in right now, how it works. It's about understanding it at that very basic level. How is it works? Who does what? Uh, and you've just had all the introductions, so you have now have a sense of who is doing what in the room. The second part about that is managing those relationships. <coughs> those relationships. And networking, the art of networking, is really about making friends. You know, you've heard the phrase, know, like, and trust. People buy from you if they know, like, and trust you. But not many people focus on the knowing and the liking and the trusting. So friendships like that are built over time. But when they are built, they're solid. And you become the go-to person. So what I'd in I encourage you to do is start doing some relationship management today. Start building some friendships today. So we're into self-awareness, that's the first quadrant, the only quadrant track I've really got time to explore with you today. I'm going to look at that in four areas. And they are simply this, understanding your purpose, managing your inner dialogue, emotional awareness, and knowing thyself. Knowing thyself. I think this is very important. Uh, do anyone know where the phrase knowing thyself comes from? Anybody? Sorry? No, not quite. Before the Bible, actually. I think it, no, maybe not. I think it was after the Bible. Ranjit. Socrates. Socrates, Socrates uh, who was a, uh, one of the earliest philosophers in, in life. And actually, as I walked in, because Ranjit's heard the talk before, he remembered Know Thyself and went and Googled it and ended up buying a book that he's been searching for the last God knows how many years. And he's given me this, and I thought, this is really pertinent. So I'm just going to read this out, if you'll excuse me. Without self-knowledge, without self-knowledge, without understanding, the working and functions of his machine, man, man cannot be free. He cannot govern himself, and he will always remain a slave. 
Remember the saying, know thyself. Knowledge can be acquired by a suitable and complete study, no matter what the starting point is. Only one must know how to learn. What is nearest to us is man, and you are the nearest of all men to yourself. Begin with a study of yourself. Remember the saying, know thyself. And I couldn't have put it any better than that, to be honest. Everything starts with us. We have to learn to, uh, to know ourselves and also to love ourselves. And accept that we have our little foibles, we have our weaknesses, but we also have immense strengths within us. So, let's start with understanding your purpose. And the first thing I want to talk about here is Jahari's window. Anyone heard of Jahari's window before? Jahari's window is a management concept that was brought about by two Australians called Joe and Harry, hence Jahari's window. But it's a really simplistic, important, powerful concept. So if you just bear with me, to four boxes, imagine four boxes, and these are the four quadrants of your life right now. There's the stuff that you only you know, I should say closed book by the way, uh, there's the stuff that only you know that nobody else knows. We all have our little secrets that we don't want to share with the rest of the world, that's fine. There are little things that we know that we just don't want to share with the rest of the world. That's fine. And then there's the next window. The next window is the open book. The next window is the, is the stuff that I know about me and you know about me. So that's the, the open book. The next quadrant is what I call the blind spot. The blind spot is what you know about me but what I don't know about me. And finally, there is the fourth. This is the stuff that you don't know, I don't know about me. Now let me explain these in a bit more detail. So the stuff here is fairly easy, the closed book. This is the stuff that we just don't want to share with anybody else. That's fine. And we'll all have those little secrets and that's absolutely fine. The open book is, it is who you are. It's how you are seen in the world and how you present yourself to the world. That's fine as well. Actually, it's a really good area. And the trick is this to try and extend that area to be as big as we can make it. So the two ways that you're going to do this is by reducing the blind spot. So if the blind spot is stuff that people know about you but you don't know about yourself, how do you think you might increase the blind spot? Ask questions. You know, the whole concept of feedback, this is why everybody talks about feedback. You hear it all the time, 180 degrees feedback, 360 degree feedback. This is why feedback is so important, because what you're doing is you're reducing this blind spot to make this as much of your open book as possible. This part here, that you don't know about yourself, that others don't know about you, is your area of potential. And that's why my brand is called Ignite Your Inner Potential because we all have it, uh, uh, folks. We all have this secret potential within us that we need to dig down deep inside of us. When we do things and we thought, oh my goodness, I never thought I could, I could do that. I never believed I could be able to do that and yet I'm doing it. I never believed I'd be running a business after the police service, but I'm doing it. I never thought that that business would be successful, but I'm doing it. In two weeks time, Channel who just reached out to me to, to, to do a program with them on leadership and policing. I never expected that. And this is the kind of stuff that happens when you become in your zone. This is the kind of stuff that happens when you start exploring that inner self, when you start living to your true strengths and your true abilities. But most of us, most of us are stuck, and I'll come on to a bit of neuroscience in a, a short while, most of us are stuck in the automatic response area of our brains. So I'm going to teach you about an area of your brain that we need to start accessing a lot more of because that's where your hidden gems are centered. Your purpose. Now you'll have heard this so many times. Your purpose is your foundation, your why. Everyone says, think about your why. Robert Byrne once said that the purpose of life is a life of purpose. And I just think that if we're not living intentional lives where we truly believe that we're having an impact on the world, we will never truly live a passionate life. And what happens is if you're not living a life full of passion or a business that is in, uh, 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 creating passion within you, the first challenge that comes along, you're going to give up. Because passion becomes your fuel. And you need fuel in the tank to be able to power through any challenges. Because there's one guarantee I'm going to make to every single person in this room, you're going to have challenges. 
I've had thousands of challenges in my life. I have seen countless deaths in my life. I've been, I have seen families destroyed by actions of other people in my life. I've had personal tragedies in my life. We are all going to have challenges. But it's passion that pulls you through. When I started my business only four years ago, having had 32 years of policing, knowing nothing but a life of service, I came out of that bubble that I was in, blinking as if I'd just come out of a dark room, thinking, what is going on? It was a very loud world that I came into. And I got into this world of personal development. I went to a Tony Robbins event. Anyone who been to a Tony Robbins event? It's like a rock show for personal development. And everyone seems to be on steroids. You know, everyone is louder. And even after the event, I got stuck in this very loud audience. And they were all like 20 something. And there's me later on in my life and having had a disciplined life of police service, I started to try, try to do work with some of these people because they saw something in me. And I thought, well, I don't know any better. So I'll try and do some work with them. But their values were not aligned to me. I think Ranjit said something about values. I have a saying on values. I will connect with like-minded people, but I only ever work with like-valued people because that's where your depth is. Because I was working with the wrong people, my business was suffering. It was just not moving forward. It's either stagnating or moving backwards. And I got so fed up that I actually closed down the company. I dissolved the company. And then my partner said to me a day after, and I was like, head in my hands. And she said to me, is that really what you want to do? You want to give up? Because this is what you've always dreamt, uh, dreamt of. Just because you've got in with the wrong people and just because it's affected you in this way, does that mean that your future has to look like this? And I thought, wow, you're a coach. And I started my business off. I created a whole new company just two days later. And that company now continues to grow. I created a, a personal development event in January 2017 with 70 people in the room. A year later, we had 200 people in the room. This year, we had 300 people in the room. In January coming up, we're gonna have 400 people in the room, 450 people in the room, and then it's going to grow 50% every 